In this episode, we're talking with Melissa Neighbour, urban planner, community builder, sustainability specialist and co-founder of Sydney Yimby. And we're going to explore how the Yimby movement believes we can drastically increase density in our cities without compromising on quality of life. We want to know if planning laws get relaxed and developers can add a few more stories, will they get to keep 100% of the resulting windfall profits? And who is likely to win the argument, the pro-development Yimbys or the anti-development NIMBYs? How long before the balance of power shifts away from the older, more financial and more entrenched NIMBYs to allow a significant increase in dwellings to be built in built-up areas and ease our housing crisis? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. Our guest today is Melissa Neighbour. She is the owner and director of Sky Planning, a purpose-driven town planning consultancy based in Sydney and co-founder of Sydney Yimby. She has developed and implemented award-winning sustainable development projects across Australia and is a strong advocate for building progressive, inclusive cities that unleash and amplify your peak potential as a human being, whilst regenerating the natural environment. Not a big ask at all. Melissa regularly consults the government and industry and presents at major forums, including TEDx, on the innovations, trends and forces that are shaping urbanism and defining our communities. Now, welcome, Melissa. We are looking forward to a very meaty discussion today. Well, it's a very meaty topic, so, yep. (laughs) Sure. Melissa, like I just said to you um, prior to coming on there, we haven't had many guests, you know, our listeners, if you always want to, you can tell us who you'd like us to interview. We had a couple of people ask for you and... I think it's um people would know that we're up for this conversation because we've been pro exploring ways to you know solve the housing crisis on many different levels. But before we um go too deep in what you're actually doing right now, can you kind of talk about the origin of Sydney Yimby and you know how your movement's been growing and I guess the market timing and how it's become such a big issue? Yeah, oh, I'd love to, Chris, and thanks for having me on, Veronica and Chris. Um, so we started in April. And there was sort of a group of ad hoc YIMBYs floating around Sydney. Um, and the, certainly um, Greater Canberra, the YIMBY movement there, and um, YIMBY Melbourne had made a lot of progress. So there was a bit of like, well, if they've done it and they're getting some traction, maybe we need to do that here too in Sydney. And the real catalyst was um, a group of um, the core founders were at a, a council meeting where there was a proposal being put forward to upzone a few blocks around um, an inner west um, metro station, a uh, train station, to allow for four story development, kind of maximise that that um, public transport uh, node. And there were fifty people in that room from organised resident action groups to voice a big no, we don't want that. And there was a handful of, of us, our Yimby group that was had not yet formed um, that went there to say yes and was really, I guess, taken aback by the reality of the situation, which is, you know, you've got that many people saying no to what is a quite reasonable uh, proposal um, and, and what I would call as a, a, from a town planning perspective really good urban design. Um, and you know, and then we had just a handful of people who were saying yes to it. And and the majority of the people saying no was certainly from the older demographics. So that group of people went to a pub nearby and just, you know, <laughs> kind of taken aback by the situation and said, right, well, you know, as I said, you know, we're running in the foot, um, you know, in uh, behind the the trail that um, Melbourne and, and Canberra have done. Surely we can do that here too. And that was like, right, the catalyst, let's get together and and pull together a group and start to take action. So that's April 2023 and YIMBY stands for yes in my backyard as opposed to NIMBY, which is not in my backyard. So the yes in my backyard, this is sort of interesting. Now, I'm I'm sort of, I understand 
arguments on both sides of the equation here, right? So I, I'm certainly uh, I'm not a fence sitter, but I'm but I'm not necessarily firmly in either camp. <laughs> I'm in the demographic of the NIMBY camp, but I'm not. I don't think like a NIMBY person, right? So, but interestingly enough, one of the the I guess the arguments that a lot of NIMBYs use is about overdevelopment and and strain on on infrastructure and and um, various other things, traffic, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not just that. I have seen myself evidence of such poor urban design all around. And we let's talk about Sydney, but I'm sure this is the case. I've, oh, look, I've been around Brisbane, I've been around Melbourne, on those parts of all, all three of those cities and, and Canberra too, really, um, where you can see evidence of, of really, really pretty horrible urban design, lots of development. And you think, oh, I'm not, I'm not a fan of being pro-development, not if that's what you get, you know. But good urban planning is expensive, right? It's much cheaper to throw up a building that hasn't had any planning really in, in it hasn't invested in any planning. So so from the UB perspective, how is that reconciled? Is it reconciled because basically if you can get more uh, more apartments or more dwellings on a site, therefore you can afford to invest in planning? Is that sort of the trade off there? How does it how do you reconcile that or square that circle? Yeah, really good question. So um and I've got a few ways to answer it. I think this is part of part of where the the pattern book comes into play. So you might have heard that thrown around recently. Chris Minns, yep. uh, the Premier, has come out and said that he's um, going to be working on a pattern book, which is a pre-approved design for medium, low to medium rise development. And so I think what that enables um, the market to do is to respond to changing planning controls, which they need to go hand in hand, which is another topic, but um, respond and and deliver high quality um, development because all of those architectural elements have been resolved. So it's a lot easier for the market to deliver high quality housing when you have something like that in place. So that would then become the framework and if they didn't comply with that they wouldn't be able to go ahead because the reality is that a lot of people say around development that well the market will only bear some of the if the market if the market is there for horrible badly built apartments and people are going to pay through the nose for it then why would you do anything different you know you go lowest common denominator and just deliver what somebody's prepared to pay um so i guess even with that framework what is the incentive and and I guess all the the safeguards to ensure that we do get a better outcome. So if the pattern book is accompanied with broad scale upzoning, what we start to remove is this monopolistic um, monopolistic uh, environment, and instead we get a very highly competitive environment. We have lots of players that can now enter the market to deliver new housing, and they're going to be competing with each other for sales. And so if we have suddenly opened up most of the city to allow for more development, which at the moment it's very closed and restricted, there's hard, just like a, hardly any sites to do medium density development, um, it, you know, in the more urbanised area of Sydney is what I'm referring to, which is where we think we need more housing. Um, yeah, it, it enables for that competition to be created. And do you think, um, I mean, the whole Yimby versus NIMBY, do you, do you find that uh, people sometimes they would say they're a YIMBY till they buy and then as soon as they yeah. buy, they become a NIMBY? Like, because people today are paying price of a property is based on an element of NIMBYism, right? Like the the, the scarcity of a, a price of property is based on its scarcity and scarcity is driven by how much future development there's going to be. So if, you know, do you think that people, if they get if they can't afford to buy, let's say they're in their twenties and they're, they're buying five, 10 years away. It's like, well, I need a solution because housing's running on me. But for the people who are getting close to entering the market or have entered the market in recent years, then almost their self-interest takes over and they, they almost like, well, oh, I, I don't, as long as I can afford to buy, I then, after I bought, I want to keep prices up because A, I've got a big mortgage and B, I need the, the benefits of that. Like, is, is it- Shut the gate behind you. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, I guess the older generations that Oh, I need to have the value of my property and my house worth a lot because I'm going to retire one day. So you're kind of fighting this battle of your, your or do you think that people are living a bit more away from self-interest than as a bigger social issue? 
I think there is a bigger social issue and I think it depends on how tapped into you, to that you are. And I think it's easy to forget, and I believe part of Sydney Yimby's role is to remind people that new new housing enables your children to be able to afford to buy a house. It enables your, you know, potentially your grandparents to be able to stay to live in Sydney. So while you might, you know, um, have just a place you might also want some help with the kids <laughs> speaking you know I've only got one but I know he's a handful um and it would be great to have mum and dad around um also there's the other element now of course where we have um essential workers who can't afford to live in suburbs so it's one uh, of those things where I say you know well um maybe someone who's aging they might want someone to come and clean their house but then they're going but you can't live in my suburb or I want a paramedic when I need them but, um, you know, that, yeah. I, I just saw on the news last night that somebody passed away as a result of an ambulance not being able to get there fast enough. Um, so I think it's important to remember that broader social element that you're mentioning, Chris, is actually can impact us directly. So we, we've interviewed Michelle Adair a number of times. She's uh, CEO of the Housing Trust in, in Illawarra and she's a, a, a big sort of name, I guess, in the community housing sector. And... and she talks about sort of the multi, uh, and I apologies if I get the terminology wrong, but but, but multi levels of ownership within a, a complex. You know, so you've got social housing, you've got low cost housing, you've got also just market priced housing, and how that can sit side by side and and helps create a cohesive and 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 a diverse uh, um, population for our suburbs as well. Like you're saying, we don't want to segregate uh, ourselves away from. The, the people that actually keep our, you know, keep the wheels turning. Um, yeah. How are we going to get our barista to make coffee if the barista can't afford to live close to where we want to line up for our coffee in the morning? You know what I mean? We're, we're very privileged people. It, certainly I think your your office and my office are actually in the same suburb. So, you know, oh. <laughs> you get what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, we need that. We we need that um, that ability for people of, of all levels in our society to be able to live across our cities and even in regional centres as well, obviously. But we're sort of talking about Sydney here, and I mean by and also we're talking about other cities. We're not just the principle applies to other cities, of course. So, is there? I, I guess how effective do you think the Yimby movement will be in? ultimately getting some changes as to the way we look at things or is it that you guys are going to dovetail nicely in with really the reality of the situation and that political will that now we have because we do have a dire problem Very. and and your relevance um you know chris said earlier you know is it true that you're a yimby until you buy a property so is it the province of young people is it the province of of youthful naive um, exuberance and enthusiasm, and you haven't had you haven't had all the cynicism of life beaten into you yet. Is it that? And or are you the, you know, are we on the cusp of a new way of looking at planning as a result of this? Tell, tell me your vision for the world, I guess, because I'm 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 hopeful. It's a big question. I may sound well, like a crusty old cynical thing, but I am hopeful. Yeah, good. So, so am I. Look, I think what I'll pick up on there is in terms of the younger demographic. Um, and, and in terms of us being able to make a change, what we've been really successful in doing is actually engaging with the younger audience. And not only that, but what we've found that they're, they are asking, so it's member, member-driven um, uh, desire that will demand to understand how the planning system works and how they can get involved in, and have a say. And the reality of the planning system is that even when... Uh, a new development is proposed and it meets all of the controls. It's completely complied. So a DA goes in, council go, yep, that's approved. If there is enough objections that will go to a local planning panel and that panel can decide to refuse it on the basis that the, the community doesn't want it. So we're therefore right. that housing is being knocked back. So what's really important is, and what's amazing is that now we're actually training um, younger people in the 101 of the planning system and they are now being armed with the tools and resources that they need to be able to go down to those meetings and say, yes, I want this development. And that can swing the the, the approval process and that's where we can start to create change, And which we've, we've actually already seen. We've had some wins in that regard. Melissa, I was about 
it would have been 10 years ago. It might have been even longer. I was sitting with a client up at Bondi Junction. Um, and uh, it was a bit older, this this chap. He was like a financial planner. I was a planner as well. And he got a phone call mid-meeting. And um, he said, I've got to really answer this one. And I just sat there and I was listening to his call, right? And he was basically, he lived in Vaucluse. And um, he was part of that, a coordinated uh, council, what did you call it? Uh, the, the group of neighbors that were trying to fight a development in the area. The coordinated action group, you called it. Um, and, you know, they were basically strategizing on that phone call and I was listening to it and I was like completely naive. I didn't think this happened, but, and they were basically saying, this is the development that's happening. This is what I'm going to lodge. This is what you're going to lodge. We need to get on this. It was literally like a little war effort to stop this development happening. And how prolific is this in councils um, that have, you know, people have been living there 30, 40 years. I mean, I look at the DAs around where I are on the Northern beaches and, you know, and read through the submissions um, just out of curiosity. And you're right. So do you, is it really hard to dislodge the individual action groups because of the NIMBYs aren't, they're not getting a voice in these areas anywhere that can compete with these established networks? Chris, you're, you just hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. Um, they are well-oiled machines. And they know how the system works. And usually they might be retired or they've got just more time on their hands yeah. than what, say, yeah, other people do who are trying to make a living, raise a family, pay the rent. Um, those are the priorities yep. usually younger people. Um, and so, and, and in fact, as I said, like preference is given to those who are already privileged. Preference is given to, um, the weight is given to those who are, who are homeowners. And so it is Ugh. a lot harder to, to combat that. And that's why what we're doing at Sydney Yimby is we're offering a vehicle to make it easy. So we actually will notify our members when um, really great planning proposals are going up for upzoning or when um, big DAs with lots of housing are being put up and we will help them to draft submissions um, and we'll let them know when the meeting dates are and when they can get down there. Um, and I think what we're also uh. offering is, in my opinion, is we're also offering a community. Um, you know, we are, you know, we run social events we have online platforms where which are buzzing all the time, and people are talking about, you know, um, issues in their in their neighbourhood, whether it, whether it is parking or parks or whatever it is that makes a good neighbourhood, um, as well as more uh, uh, more housing. And so, I think there's a real magnetic um, attraction for people who are interested in this to join our community and to be active, especially when we're having wins and you can see it's making a difference. It's really strong motivation. It's funny because what's going through my head just hearing Chris's story and what you were saying there is that, you know, developers on one hand are responsible for some pretty shitty friggin' buildings around, you know, like pretty horrible and and not really doing the development industry, if you like, a, a great service. And then on the other hand, they're up against it. You know, when you've got, when they're trying, they've bought a site and they're actually trying to work within planning rules, if they're trying to do the right thing even, you're saying that if there's such an organised um protests against that and there's no no what no other voice to counteract that then then they are at risk of really underdeveloping their side if they're able to do anything i mean a classic example i guess and i and maybe i'm going to a hornet's nest here is the uh the old balmain leagues club site now i know your office is in balmain obviously mine's in balmain i actually have not kept up with what's been happening with that but that's been a derelict site now for probably 20 years, close to 20 years, uh, maybe 15. But um, it's had numerous proposals go through. There's been huge um, resident action groups to protest it, et cetera, et cetera, and it's stymied it. And obviously it's it's uh, cost someone a lot of money. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a site that's ugly and begging for redevelopment, begging for it. But obviously whatever has been you know the compromise that have been put forward clearly there's not enough money in it or just not viable and so it's not going to go ahead so I know I'm sure there's sites like that are everywhere but then yeah I hear stories also of developers sitting on sites just waiting I think you use the term up zoning I'm guessing that's what it means is where the zoning changes so that they can put more more uh, dwellings on on a site so they they're waiting and lobbying to get that through so that they can actually make a much greater profit 
Um, so it, it's complicated, isn't it? Because I mean, just in some of those examples I put forward, developers have been at the at the brunt and they've suffered at the hands of these uh, at NIMBYs. And on the other side of things, developers have actually been quite guilty of, of really not providing great housing. So how do we reconcile this? You know, how do we, how do we, and, and you talked about this planning, you know, the controls and the frameworks and all the rest of it, but it's not just, oh, okay, if they comply with this, then we'll let them get it through. I mean, there's also all that sentiment that that brings out in people as well. You know, is this the, the perception you know, that would frame people and, and get people riled up, I would imagine. So it's not as simple as, you know, is it a good development for the area? But there's all this other stuff. It's very loaded, right? It's very complex. It's very late. And there's a lot of factors that come in to, to enable a development to get up and um, delivered to the market, as you said, from both the developer's perspective and the communities. Um, yeah, I think what's interesting around what you said there was this idea of um, it's almost, I think there's a lot of perceived negativity and it probably is on the back of bad developments that have happened but um it's not uh, it's what we're trying to work on at the moment is to um put together some rigor around qualitative data or at the moment it's anecdotal but we want to put it into a more of a comprehensive study that shows where communities or people oppose a development while it's going through the assessment process yeah. and then actually turn around and go this is the best thing to happen to our neighborhood we love it, but X, Y, Z. And we just hear that time and time again. And so I think that's part of the story is to show what good development can look like. Um, you know, hopefully the government gets behind pre-approving some of that good development so we know that that's um, going to be brought to the market and we're not so feared of, fearful of bad development. But also when a proposal is put up, we'll can we talk about the benefits and can we talk about what actually could come as a result of this and what um, increased livability it can bring to your own lifestyle? I think it's that density done well, isn't it? It's the, that, and I think people hate change and, you know, the unknown of what could happen there and is that ever going to impact me? And then when it's finally done, they go, the impact from me is actually minimal and actually it's a positive because I've actually got a cafe now and I've actually got somewhere <laughs> I can go to the shops and, um, and you know, even out where I am, there was this, uh, development happening with an IGA was going in and I looked at the submissions for it and they were chaos, but that IGA is packed, you know, um, and people are going there all the time and, you know, it's like 10 apartments. So it's not a big development. Um, so I think it's that density. I think you're right. Like getting some more case studies. I think it was in Northcote in Melbourne. Like, you know, they, uh, they're very anti-development within that pocket. But, you know, you have to, but yeah, they have to make sure that it's, you know, architectural, they have to make sure it's going to really suit the streetscape. But once people, so then people are comfortable with, I guess, things getting approved, they don't fight it as much because there's, they know that there's certain element of control around what actually gets approved. So it's a fine line, isn't it? You don't want to be too relaxed, but then you don't want to be too controlling in, um, cause then people will just fight it too hard to do developments. Exactly. Yeah. One of my favorite examples is, um, the Summer Hill uh, the flour mill development at yeah. Summer Hill. Oh, yes. I was thinking of that, actually, when you were, were talking. You? Yeah, it was. And, yeah, that had that was met with fierce opposition from a number of resident groups. And interestingly enough, those community groups that were opposing it now meet and use the community hall that was built up as part of an age. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's yeah. ironic. I'm hoping but, to catch some of this. But that is set amongst a lot of other um, development that's absolutely awful. That's really? that's adjacent to some pretty horrible developments. Um, so, you know, and a lot of those were done beforehand. So I can understand why those people were really up in arms about it because they're thinking, shit, look what we've just got. You know, we don't want um we don't want more of that. But I do think it's actually a really it's a it's a really nice development there. And 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 it's a good example of good urban design. But what I'm I'm actually curious, because you said what, you know, design done well, what does that look like? Do you yeah. have a definition? Well, it did, yeah, I mean, you can if you're talking site specific, or if you're then talking General. about the, yeah, the cum yeah. accumulative effect of good development, and in my my opinion, that's where um you get that level of density where you've got parklet p open space, you can walk to get your hair done to get the milk, you know. At the moment, we've got communities that are even if someone wants to go and visit their friends, they're getting in the car, let alone to go to work. Um, so that I think reducing that car dependency, 
um, is really important. And that obviously then opens up and, and strengthens, um, you know, community interaction and, and strengthens like that, that real community feeling within a, a neighborhood. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's important to get to the level of density where we can have mixed use development, um, enabling and with, with green open, um, space and, and enabling that, t- facilitating that kind of lifestyle but obviously with good public transport as well and when you get to that level of density that the, the frequency of public transport naturally increases so you know that the government will um you know up uh, uh, whatever it is to enable more sorry In- increase <laughs> the services <laughs> yeah that's okay yeah, go again. we get it well, there's more people using it, so they're going to run more trains, run more buses, run more ferries, run more, you know, light rail, whatever. That's right. Yeah, that was actually what to to. It's make funny actually because I've I've I live in Newtown and I and I started going to a hairdresser in Darlinghurst, right? And I went there the first time, and I suddenly it dawned on me. I drove, you know, because I'd been in the office and I drove across there, and um, it suddenly dawned on me when I got there. Oh God, I'm going to need a good good three hours. You know, got a fair bit of grey hair's got to get rid of, and and. I had to go and stick it in a public car park at the hospital and walk, you know, walk miles to get there. And I actually, this, today when I went, I got the train, you know, um, and I actually was there and back. I reckon it would have taken the same amount of time for me to drive there, find a car space, walk, you know what I mean? It was, and, and that's the benefit of living in a dense area with uh, lots of service by very, very good public transport. And exactly. of course, I mean, a house, I'm not in an apartment, but, you know, our houses are all very close together because I'm in the inner city. But I guess that's what you get with density, isn't it? I mean, you do get that walkability and you do get that really, that frequency of, of public transport. You look in the outer burbs where I grew up, you know, and that's what you're talking about there. Ev- everybody's house is on a bigger block of land. So that means that every street that stretches longer and, and you've got so much further to walk if you want to walk anywhere, it takes forever. So therefore you, you're required to, and everyone's spread out so the bus routes aren't as efficient. So it, it makes perfect sense. But but we that's our dream, isn't it? That's the great Australian dream. I mean, how are we dealing with that reset as to what we expect? There's our right. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's the dream for some people, but um, at the moment with the lack of housing diversity, it's not even really possible for anybody else to have another dream. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, yeah, I think that's why if we get this loosening of the planning controls, um, we're going to get other types of developments brought onto the market. And that means people who do want a different lifestyle, people who do want the vibrancy of an inner city suburb, they can have that choice. Whereas at the moment, um, yeah, well, they're either moving really far out west or they're leaving Sydney altogether because they can't afford to live here. So right now, um, it seems like it's all the forces are behind you guys, right? Like the, and this is, this is not, and I do think it's a bit of a battle between the, people who are pro and, you know, society that's so entrenched, all those things we spoke about. Like Chris Minns is totally for development, right? Like he can see the social issue that Sydney will lose its status as a city that people want to move to, that people want to live in. If you can't afford to live, rent, uh, your kids can't afford to stay, your, your parents have to move out and downsize. And so, you know, this, and we can't get key worker housing, you know, et cetera. So we, we need to solve this problem. And he's all for development do you see that um, i was just reading this morning like in crow's nest um you know the council got overruled the council rejected a proposal to build an apartment but the state government overruled them for the second time second time it's happened for you know approving a development do you see that where the government's basically going to start to override local councils sort of um and start you know rezoning and basically you know putting the power back in you know, the people rather than leaving it in the council's hands who, who have been able to say yes and no to developments in the past. Yeah, well, I don't want to speculate too much on where I think that power between the shift in power may happen between council and state. I think that will that does look like the state government is going to be making moves to allow more pathways for development to go through. What yeah. that looks like and the extent of that, we're not sure of yet. Um, but I just wanted to touch on a point that you made there about the importance of providing more housing. And one reason why, as you said, um, Chris Minns is pushing it is because of this, the brain drain, the, the loss of, um, you know, skilled workers leaving the city. What's really interesting is that the Yinbin movement, which started over in the States, was actually started and funded by um, the big tech companies like Google and and the and Microsoft because 
they yeah. they didn't have staff because they couldn't afford to live in in the California and all these places. So they actually started the Yimby movement. So um, it's not it's not uncommon to see those th- those those reasons being linked, and, and Chris Minns is doing that. Um, whether or not the the action he's going to take is going to match what we want to see is yet to be seen. Um, it's it, he's saying the right things, but we need some real deep policy reform to be able to build more housing in Sydney, and we have not seen that yet. I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions. And you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. And there you'll find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, access to suburb help for investors, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower North Shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. If you're thinking about buying your first home, upgrading to a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly get the finance right. Please reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Don't forget that you can download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. I mean, there were some articles in the SMA saying it's going to be these six or seven zones and you know, some leakages of their plans and stuff like that. But is that is that enough just to, like, do you think? Because we've had this argument or this argument discussion um, that zoning doesn't automatically uh, mean you get supply, right? Because, yeah. you know, that doesn't mean the developers are just all of a sudden going to be able to sell it all and or build it all profitably because of market pricing, you know, building costs, labor. So, you know, is even if there is zoning, does it have to be quite restricted and, you know, go on the metro line and go on the public transport links and let's at least focus on those in the short term and try to, um, or do you think it should be much more blanketed and, you know, open the market up and then the developer can basically say, well, I know I could build on the metro line, but I can't make it profitable there, but I can do it in Mossman and I can make it more profitable in Rose Bay and I can make it because of purchase price. So the developer can pick and choose because there's mass rezoning. Or do you think it's just better to do it where the transport links are? No, I think everything all at once, which is something the Housing Now Alliance says a lot as well. Um, I think both. I think we need to be upzoning, absolutely upzoning along the metro stations. That's just really um, good, um, you know, town planning, develop, um, you know, proposals and developments. I think the fact that there's seven precincts that have been identified is, is a shame. We do. I think it should be a lot more. Um, and I think then what we don't want to get is, you know, I guess many cities or, or high development areas with just this urban carpet in between, that's what I call it, this, the, the, you know, the low density carpet in between all of these centers. It would yeah. be really great to actually allow, as you said, have that broad scale up zoning to allow developers to get into the market, into any area and open up Sydney so that everyone can live where they want to. Now, what are, what are you proposing, though? Because, like, in an inner city area, right, you've got lots of conservation areas, lots of housing um, that is protected, and you've got streetscapes that are protected. It's already high density from a, from a house perspective. I'm not saying it's high density living, but it's higher density, say, than your suburban lots. Right. Um, then you've got the middle ring. You know, you've got the middle ring. But, but of course, you've got, sorry, you've got, you've got um, urban infill. You've got old industrial sites that have been repurposed and that sort of stuff. But then you've got the middle ring where you've got your family homes that maybe, uh, you know, between wars or maybe slightly, you know, maybe from uh, Federation through to, to World War Two, or maybe. And then you've got sort of further out, you've got more of the 60s, you know, development, 50s, 60s, 70s development. Are you... Promoting mowing down, you know, suburban streets full of family homes, uh, so you can sort of turn them all into townhouses. I mean, I know some suburbs that is what that is actually what's happening. But what what are you promoting there? Because I think that there is a little bit of a fear about that. It's like, oh my god, our our communities are going to change. The look and feel of them are going to change, and that that is something that people obviously don't want. Um, tell tell me how that how that works. Yeah, well, I mean, it's up to somebody whether or not they want to sell it, say the property was rezoned, it's up to them if they were to then to sell that. And as Chris said before, it's not a guarantee that a developer is going to move in if something's being rezoned. Um, but I think the way that I kind of think about this is that 
In my view, cities are meant to be progressive and evolve with the times. And while we have these beautiful areas in Sydney, and I think heritage conservation can play a role in that, I'm not sure that we need to have, you know, such a high percentage of heritage conservation over our, you know, inner city areas when people can't afford to live here and we are in a crisis and the city does want to evolve, Sydney does want to become the best that it can be. And putting um, our suburbs under glass with these heritage conservation areas means that we're just going to be having suburbs that are stuck in a certain era instead of, you know, in 2050 looking back going, oh, well, it's still so it's like the 60s around here. Like, has anything <laughs> happened? Uh, you know, we, we want to, uh, you know. It's, for, allow- it's probably more like it still looks like the 1860s, but. Um- <laughs> yeah, true, true, um, depending on where you are. But on that, though, I mean, I think that there are certain suburbs. So so the Middle Ring suburbs are all developed around the same sort of time. The problem is when you're looking at areas where, that have gone through gentrification is there's been quite a lot of individual investment in some properties and there's still some, you know, waiting to be renovated. So it's a real patchwork quilt of opportunity. You know, you're not going to necessarily going to have an unrenovated house that could be demolished next uh, to another yeah. unrenovated house that could be demolished. The next one could be renovated and then the next one renovated, the next one about to be renovated and so on, then another unrenovated. So you're not going to get this sort of cohesive um you know, a row of five of them, for argument's sake, all all prepared to buddy up and sell off to a developer and turn it into, say, you know, low-rise housing. Um, so that must bring in constraints. There must be some more, I guess, smarter or, or there must be some particular suburbs, for argument's sake, or, or particular vintage of housing that is all sort of coming to that stage of maturity at the same time. When I say maturity, it's it potentially got owners of a similar age, for argument's sake, that might be all ready to downsize in a similar time. There must be some suburbs that are that sort of lend themselves more to that rezoning than something that is, you know, more established and, and where a lot of people have actually invested a lot of money in the individual houses. Would that be yeah, fair to say? I think that's definitely fair to say. Um, and I would say that rather than the planning system dictating that, I think it's better to leave it up to the market and just rezone um, or, 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 you know, allow more medium density housing, say, in the R2 zone, which is the low density zone, and allow the market to respond. Because as as we said before, the, feasi- the, the for the feasibility to stack up, there's so many things that have to come into play. And yeah. so the more restrictive that planning is, the more restrictive it gets down the line. So if we can at least open up the start of the funnel, um, we've got more chance of more housing getting delivered through the, the pipeline. And and one other argument I've heard too, I think was might have been a Wallara councillor or somewhere like that, was basically saying that, you know, yeah, sure, you can build all these, these apartment buildings in Bonda Junction for argument's sake. Um, yeah, I might be totally misquoting the wrong the wrong council, but the idea being that this is an expensive area, right? Land is expensive. It doesn't matter what you build, you're going to be having apartments that are $2 million. Here's that really going to be freeing up um, or making opportunity for people who can't afford otherwise how to get into this marketplace. So I guess what is the response to an argument like that? Because in a way, land has to be cheap enough or or what you can build on that land Um needs to be ultimately cheap enough to still make it accessible, correct? And and then you've got this also the problem that developers are buying land and if the price, the sale prices go down, you know, in the face of rising building costs, like, you know, what's to say they're not going to still land bank even if there's higher zoning? You know what I mean? It's, it's just that more supply doesn't necessarily mean um, more accessible in terms of being able to purchase it. Well, that's a really interesting point and it's one that I decided to do some real deep, deep research on because I also wanted the answer to know right. that, okay, <laughs> yeah, if luxury apartments are brought on to, uh, onto the market, particularly in Sydney, we know that it's going to be high end. Um, how is that really going to filter down and help, you know, essential workers find find more homes or be able to afford a home? And so what the research is showing from overseas um, the most recent research, which which actually concurs with earlier uh, research done from, I think it was US, Finland, and there's another place, which I can send you. Um, another country was also um, part of the study. And what it showed is that 
essentially when more uh, expensive housing comes onto the market, um, we have people at the higher socioeconomic um, ring purchase that, but that actually frees up other housing. And so it trickles down through the system we, and we get overall lower rents um, and lower house prices as a result of that, that um, housing being delivered, even when it's at the higher end. <laughs> I've wondered about that. I have actually asked some of the economists that have come on this podcast that sort of, because I had that theory myself that w- what you just said, and I've, it's, and I have to, I can't remember who, uh, who you shouted me down, but I've been shouted down a couple of times by saying, no, it doesn't work that way. So yeah. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Okay. I, I would say that's definitely true in some sense, but I, I would say that unfortunately what we're seeing as brokers and, and this is what's supporting house prices right now is the amount of intergenerational wealth that is getting passed down the generation. So let's say someone is doing that. They're moving from a three, four, $5 million home into a $2 million apartment. Um, that excess cash goes somewhere, right? It might go into their super. It might go, um, you know, in, into their living, you know, it was an investment fund or something. But a lot of it's actually getting passed down to the generation below. Um, and then they're just reinvesting. So what I think is, if anything, it's, and they're re-borrowing the money. So let's say they had $1.5 million left over. They had two kids. They gave two of their kids seven fifty dollars each. Then the kids go and borrow another million dollars on that. And it's what it's doing is actually creating more inequality through, you know, just the people who have got money are giving it to their kids. Um, and then they're, they're the only ones who are able to participate in the marketplace. So I would say it's, it's almost because... By creating, they couldn't downsize. They would just stay in their home. Um, well, but by being able to downsize, it's then freeing up cash, which is then going to their kids, which yes, the kids are entering the home, but they're already probably going to enter the housing market anyway, because they probably had the income on the education, stuff like that. So I would just say that's a, it's a real, and then they're probably getting, because of leverage, um, that 1.5 is then getting re-borrowed by kids who are earning income probably getting even more money into the market. So it's creating um, under a small number of stock, which is even creating higher prices. So yeah, it's it's crazy amount of money that's in the system that's just lazy cash in home equity that is, is slowly getting passed down. And that's making it even harder for people who haven't got parents with money to enter yeah. the market because they just can't compete. You know, you can't compete with a first home buyer who's got a million dollar deposit. Um, and I mean, what, besides development though, like what are some of the other changes that you believe has to happen to create a fairer market? Like, cause you could go for tax as well. Like the Sydney Yimby movement could have a pro development charter. It could have a change in tax settings, whether it's changed capital gains tax on your home, you know, home included in your pension test. Are you guys just focusing on the development side or are you expanding the housing affordability to other changes that should happen to create a fair, more equal system? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that we're open to other options, but our focus, we're very um, laser focused on what we believe and want to see changed and we believe will make a difference. And that really is changes to the planning controls. Um, And so that's what we're focusing on at the moment. you know, what, where, where it goes down the track, I can't say, but that really is our number one focus. What, what is, what's your takes on, um, like treescape and things like that? we talked about heritage there, like, um, and you know, and I can kind of see what you're saying there. Like, it's all beautiful having this great street of heritage facades, beautiful gardens, trees in an inner city location. So it's great for the 50, hundred people who live there. Right. But, um, and it's great. And, and we've got lots of pockets of that across our city, right? Lower North Shore, East, Inner West, up on the beaches. Um, but, you know, if that overall is holding our city back, what's the point of having nice housing if people can't afford to live or are homeless? So, you know, but how does like the, you know, when you say sustainability and climate change and things like that, like a lot of areas are quite, you know, particularly in the, the upper North, there's lots of trees. And, you know, to get more pro development, you're going to have to start cutting trees down. Like, because they're in so, so how do you sort of deal with that challenge of the damage to our habitat with density? Yeah, really good question. Well, I think the thing is that we have existing building footprints that probably could facilitate um, greater density. So a really big home with a big building footprint could actually potentially be four apartments or even six apartments, uh, depending. 
And so we can get high density by, you know, using the existing building footprints, but, you know, in, in making infill development a little bit more clever. Um, and then there's other controls that come into play um, with any new development. And if the sites are big enough, if we can consolidate sites, then the developer can have room to provide, and, and they're allowed to go a little bit higher, you know, we can have six, uh, like three, you know, three stories, six apartments, and they can have a really great communal open space because the the, the height allowed for it to be spread um, up rather than out. And therefore that landscaped ratio or that landscaped control can be met um, at, a, at a standard where we can have the, you know, the trees and vegetation we need. Sort of quite nice. So there's, a, there's two streets in Alexandria, which is not exactly as you just described, but I've always thought that they they got redeveloped sort of some years ago. It's probably 20, 25 years ago now. A lot of um, sort of light industrial buildings set amongst terrace houses, so a bit of a mix, mishmash on both streets. And then the – so the development control plans obviously allowed a, a series of three-storey uh, apartment buildings to be built, and they sit really nicely alongside these houses. And it's one of the very rare places I've seen where I actually think this works quite well, and it's not mo- it's not that recent, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think it can be done. I, w- I wouldn't say that they've got a lot of that outdoor space. It's very much still right on the footpath, you know. It's not necessarily like it increases uh, amenity in that way. But I do. I, I've often thought, wow, that was sort of so different from what you see in a lot of other, um, you know, a lot of other precincts that sort of that, that urbanisation or the, the, the residential um, reuse of, of buildings. And there's a mix of, you know, converted warehouses in there as well. So it's, it's a bit of a mix, but it seems to be, it's quite cohesive. Um, yet to see that elsewhere. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. No, I'm not. But there's one here. I live in Dremoyne and there's a really new one that's been done just up the road. And it, the same thing it's it fits so nicely with the existing houses and yet it's three stories and i think it's on a corner block then i reckon they've got at least 10 apartments in there nestled in really nicely no uh, so it can be done <laughs> yeah so we done. um as you know someone who's listened to our episodes it's done like close to 300 um we probably pick up through our episodes that we're generally not a fan of buying new property right um and if at all, right? And there's many reasons for that. The investment returns, the scarcity of what you're buying. Um, and, you know, you can see that most people who have lost money on his new property. You've got building issues. You've got so many issues, right? Um, how do you think that we can, because a lot of younger people don't realize this, right? They, they, they just want housing. They just want a property, right? Which is fair enough. But generally they're buying some of the poorest quality properties out there, which get the lowest growth, right? Because they aren't scarce. They're not suitable to the family market, et cetera. So, you know, I guess one thing that, you know, and this is one thing that, you know, maybe people in the Indie movement don't realize, to be honest, that yes, they get this pro development. That doesn't mean you should go and buy a new property though. And and this is uh, because that new apartment block near the train station probably won't grow as well as that small apartment block that's in the suburbs that's, you know, 600 meters away from the train station. Um, how do we sort of combat this? Because um, yes, you can have housing, but then that means you've got to pay a mortgage, Um Yes, and that and you and yeah, that better than renting potentially, but not maybe not cheaper unless you get house price growth. So, how do we manage this? Because you know, there's there's a bit, there is challenges with the investment returns on new property versus existing, um, and uh, it's a real issue. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if I'm the most qualified person to answer this because I'm a renter, <laughs> um, and yeah. I rent where I want to live. Um, I wouldn't be able to afford to to live here. And I've not really gone through the process of, you know, buying a new property and weighing up the pros and cons between new versus old. So, um, yeah. and, and most of my clients that I work with are developers. So we're looking at redeveloping a site, not just purchasing a site to, to make money from it. So it's not an area that I can give a deep amount of insight into. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just one of the things that... Um, will happen down the line. So let's say there is this rezoning, right? Um, that will, A, more supply will, will A, slow down price growth. That's absolutely what will happen um, because of scarcity. You know, there's not a pressure to push prices up when there's more choice. This is what, and the MB movement is also pushing for slower house price growth. That's what it is, right? Um, but what it'll also do is the people who are buying this new stuff will also get the properties that actually do grow the slowest because they'll be in areas where 
um, they're going to be more supply. So you get a rezoning in the inner west, right? And they can do density. The, that's all great, yep, for the overall picture. But the people buying those in actual properties will get the lowest investment return because you've just rezoned. You've just made it really easy to build more. Um, and so I think it's it's one of the things you want might have this desire to create more housing or more more properties, but you don't actually want to be the ones buying it. Like the people, because um, you actually, the, that's not where you're going to get. So what the state government do with first time owner grants and stamp duty concessions, et cetera. They're great for the overall problem, but they're not great for you as the individual because you end up buying. Um, so it, it's, it's a really complex one because it's on the society level, it's great, but it's not great for the individual owner who's end up buying these things, whether it's an investor or a landlord. That's just, it'd be interesting to see, have you guys thought about that um, yeah, for your I own see personal we... situations? Because, yeah. yeah. I think it depends on what your own driver is. If your driver is to make money through property, then what you're saying absolutely applies. But if your driver is to um, live where you want to and to buy, you know, your your own apartment and be able to make it yours and have stability and security, if those are your drivers, I don't know if the, the how much it will go up by is as important. I think it depends on the, the purchaser. And that's, that's a good answer because it does depend on the purchase. The problem is that a lot of first-time buyers in particular are not buying their forever home first up. And so a lot of these these complexes are targeted specifically at the first home buyer and then they find that they don't get the opportunity to upgrade when they need more space because they're being cur- their capital growth has been curtailed. So that is one of the problems that, you know, the 10,000 or so people that listen to these podcasts will be fully aware of, but the masses are not. And so <laughs> they, they won't be listening to this. They won't understand that. They will be thinking... I just need to get onto the property ladder, but they not necessarily recognizing that that first property, the the power of that to leapfrog you up the the ladder as time goes on. So it's not so much about making money out of property; it's just the sh- the facts of once you have kids and once you've got more kids, you're going to need more space and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's just one of those longer term thinking that is required. But you know, but at the same, you can't use that thinking to, I mean, we think that way, but we're also advocates for solving the housing problem. We just, it's just one of those things that anybody going to buy one of these properties, it's great that they're going to be created, <laughs> but anyone going to buy one, be very wary. This is, this is the downside. Yeah. I mean, look, if we get more housing across the city, yes, house prices are going to slow, hopefully, um, which is obviously this is a long-term play. It's not going to happen overnight. But I think, you know, the the, pro- the principles of buying um, a, a property apply, you know, in terms of the value. If you if it's near a train station, if it's got good amenity, if it's got a good lifestyle, it's going to be a property that's in, you know, in demand in comparison to say one that doesn't have those, those factors. Um, and so... Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think if we had a broad scale upzoning, as I was saying before, that competitive, um, the competitive nature of the development would come into play, and we could actually have really high quality development that we may not know where the price value is going to land. Yeah, so like if you look at um, high density zones, so you look at Parramatta, with the price growth for apartments there, for example, right? Um, so. And look at how they've performed over the last six years. They've actually gone down in price. So, you know, we had a boom in that time uh, because there's very relaxed planning control and they can build for fun. So there's no restriction on supply. Um, and so the people who have gone and bought in Parramatta, which had really great zoning, have actually lost money and they've actually, their financial futures have been really restricted because, yeah, they're bought and they've actually lost money and they can't upgrade. And like Veronica is saying, so. If you got mass rezoning, if you look at places like St. Leonard's at the moment going through rezoning, those yeah. apartments will perform really poorly over the next decade because there'll be a lot more. And the apartments will be aging. So in 10 years' time, the apartment built in 2023 will be 10 years old and there'll be more apartments to buy that are newer, better, um, et cetera. And so this is one of the problems with density is that people buying them are actually getting poor investment returns. Um, and, you know, and... Even though it's in a great location, you'd say Parramatta is a great location, got train stations, et cetera. So this is just one of the issues with, mm. with density is that it feels great at first, but then you don't want to be the one buying it. Um, and, you know, whereas if it's downsizes, it's a different story because at the end of the day, like 
For example, they downsize and it underperforms the market. Well, that's fine. They've still got enough money. They're not going to... And and so building stock that really targets downsizes is actually really good. But then we have an issue where they actually release money and they pass it down and it creates inequality. So it's... it's <laughs> I would just... like, Yeah, sometimes I think this is... And this is one of the issues we saw with um, the 2019 election with the tack on negative gearing and capital gains tax is... People didn't realize that that would actually kill the investor market. So the rental crisis we have today would have been a lot worse if that policy got proved. Um, you would have seen a lot less investors entering the market the last yep. few years. And investors right now would be bailing if on the negative cash flows and would have a huge rental affordability crisis. Because, um, and so I guess it's just these, I don't know, the second, the unintended consequences I think that, you know, pro development can have for people who end up buying density. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all um, a consequence of the fact that we're in such a dire situation that we need all of this new housing quickly. If it could happen organically and new development was, was you know, zoning was increased and this stuff sort of gradually increased over time, it wouldn't be such a huge risk. But certainly just this, this massive impetus to have um, a lot more built soon is going to just ramp that up a bit. And we certainly have seen uh, in periods of boom time in Brisbane and Melbourne in particular, and even in Canberra too, you know, people buying uh, apartments on resale were losing value whilst prices of everything else was rising. And now we're seeing that in Sydney, that, that sort of because our sort of development um, uh, boom, if you like, uh, lagged behind those other cities. And so we're actually starting to see those, those outcomes now. So just something to be aware of, you know, for our listeners really. And and I get that that doesn't solve a housing problem and I get that's not what you guys are about. But I lo- what I love about the Yimmy movement is that you're saying, right, we're going to go and tackle entrenched um, re- reactionary, you know, rejection of development, particularly where it's it's good development, particularly where it complies with councils, it doesn't require rezoning. You know, you guys are... are, are arming up and and going in there and saying well actually this is this doesn't require a change in the rules this just requires more people in the community standing up and and speaking up for it so i think that you know in and of itself is a really really positive thing and and um arming people or getting people agitated enough to do something about it and arming them with the the tool, giving them the tools and arming them with the information about the actual planning process, I think is such a really important thing to take that advantage away from from those who, you know, are so entrenched, well, the NIMBYs that are so entrenched in marketplaces. So I think it's great. We support that. Yeah, look, I think we've Absolutely. got a long way to go, but, um, but we're very committed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think the um, the key is, is for me is, is trying to get that right balance between the right amount of density to also get good outcomes for the people buying the density. So you can't overzone where you basically create an uh, infinite supply in an area where there's never going to be a shortage because then the developer is just going to keep on releasing and you're going to get really relaxed uh, price growth and you're going to really impact people buying it. Um, so it's kind of like a, a slight increase in zoning, which just increase and, and in areas where people really want to live. So you don't just make it around those those transport nodes and create these little high density pockets. You you do it sort of mass market. We didn't get your property done before oh, you as be, well, Melissa. Before that though, something just occurred to me that if all prices um, slow down in terms of growth, then that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, right. But what we're talking about here is when you've got a disproportionate um, underperformance, it is actually going to increase the gap um, between yeah. those who have and those who you have not. So that's that's really where good design and good planning and not an over oversupply is, is required because it's just very care- it has to be carefully managed because that is that is the risk of you know creating a lot of a lot of stock uh, in a short period of time. So I think that's sort of putting it into context. Yeah, no, that's helpful, Veronica. Yeah, I, I, I think a really good example is um, Auckland because they had broad scale upzoning. Um, they brought that in a uh, few years ago now. And while house prices and rents still 
did increase, it was slowed. It was a lot slower than what it would have been if it had a, hadn't if that upzoning hadn't been brought yep. into place. Um, so I think I think there's something to be said for opening up um, all areas of a city, uh, you know, to create more of an even um, upzoning as opposed to just pockets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have you got a property done by for us? You might have seen that on the email. Have you got a story you can share with us to end us today? Well, I suppose I look at it from a developer's point of view, but I know you're your property investors, but I would I mean I think it's the same that you No, I think, not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Okay. Your owner well, occupiers too. We're only any property story that we can learn from is a good one. Oh look, I mean, I think it's just about getting the right advice up front. Um and sometimes you don't know what that advice is that you need to get. So I just think doing and I'm sure you already would um tell your listeners, probably listening to this podcast would be one of the things I would say to do is to, you know, do your research and then pay for quality advice. Pay for it because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna be paying a lot more down the line if you don't do that. No. Oh, we're with you on that one. Thank you so much, Melissa. I really appreciate your time. And, you know, it's this is a, a very complex area and we and it's good for us to to get a greater understanding of the goals and objectives and, and what you guys are doing. So thank you. Thank you for having me. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our amazing guests have to say.